Next on Garden Line, the Memorial Rose Garden in Rapid City. We have about 1,200 roses uh, planted in this park. And does my garden need fertilizer? Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Rick Abrahamson. Tonight we will feature three Rapid City Gardens managed by the city's parks department. One is a rose garden, another is a xeriscape garden, and the third is an arboretum. We'll also go into the garden and learn how to take a soil sample to learn what nutrients are available before planting, and then we will learn how to interpret the soil test results and apply the proper fertilizer. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions today is Mike Katangi, Extension Entomologist. Glad to be here, Rick. Welcome to Garden Line. Well, thank you. <laughs> Jerry Mills, Brown County Extension Horticulture Educator. Good evening. Good to be here. Good. Um, Mike Mecknig, Extension Weed Specialist. Good to be here, Rick. Thank you. And John Keekeffer, uh, Brookings County Extension Agronomy Educator. Thanks, Rick. Glad to be here. The phone number for you to call in is one eight. The phone number for you to call in is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Helping answer the phones tonight are a group of Brookings Master Gardeners. Please provide them with as much detail as possible about, about your garden problem, when it first appeared, and any surrounding plants with your question. Before we get to your questions, we want to give you some information about how soil testing works. Soil testing is recommended in order to know what nutrients currently exist in your soil. Once you understand your soil's fertility, you can make the right decisions about adding fertilizer. Garden Line spoke with Jim Gerwing, a re retired extension soil specialist, to learn the proper technique for collecting a soil sample in order to test soil fertility. One of the spring rituals in gardening is actually putting on fertilizer. It's one of the things we start with normally. And because it's kind of a bother to, to get a soil sample, many people we find actually skip it. So what we're going to do today is just show you how to take a sample in a, in a garden. We're going to go into the garden behind us here. And, and one thing you'll have to observe and, and watch is that we want more than just one little scoop of soil. We want to get an average of, of what's out there in the garden. So to do that, we have a bucket because we're going to have to actually stir up the samples that we get. And then I'm just using a regular garden trowel that most anybody has. So, so let's go in the garden and, and, and take a little sample. We're going to, to sample several places in the garden. In a garden this size, that's maybe 10 feet by 30 feet, maybe about, oh, eight or ten places would be good. So we'll just take this trowel and we'll make just a little bit of a hole and just kind of take a scoop along the side, take their worms and everything with it. And we'll just go to a number of different places in the in the garden. And we'll just throw a little out and take a scoop down. And the idea is that that we get it from the surface down to about as deep as that you you rototill and, and mixed in fertilizer in the in the past. And then once we have this sample we have a lot more soil then we need to send to the soil testing lab. So what we need to do is stir it up real well. Once we have it stirred up, we're going to put it in a, in a bag. And we can get these bags from the soil testing lab in Brookings, or any of the county extension offices have bags. Or you can use just any plain paper bag or plastic bag to send it into the soil testing lab. Not too difficult, really. Other things you can pick up at the county extension office, though, uh, is information sheets that we would like you to send into the soil testing lab. Uh, so when you pick up your bag, you can pick up some of these sheets. And on that sheet, you'll write your name and address and those kinds of things. And in most cases, all we need to do is check for a, a regular analysis that'll give us the analysis that we need for fertilizer recommendation for our, for our garden. So we can get that at the county extension offices, as well as 
a, a testing and fee schedule if you desire, which also has the website on it for the soil testing lab in, in Brookings. But anyhow, we picked up a bag from there, and we only need to put in that bag, oh, a couple of scoops. We need about two cups of soil, really, is, is all we need, need in that bag. If you see, like here, a worm hangs on there once in a while, you just let that guy go. And, and so we can fill the bag about, you know, about half full or so, and, and just uh, actually wind it down. And if you can get it to the soil testing lab right away within a day or two, that's all you really need to do. If you can't send it immediately uh, or get it right to the soil testing lab within a day or so, you probably want to dry the sample first. After you have the bag about half full, you can just take it in the house someplace, dump it back out onto the, onto the uh, uh, piece of paper, newspaper, have a fan blow on it overnight or so, that's all it takes. It's just so that it air dries. We don't want to put it in an oven or anything like that. And, and that would be best to, to help us get an accurate nitrogen, nitrogen test. And then send it into the soil testing lab and you will get the results back with recommendations for how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that you need on your, on your garden. So guys, um, I was watching that video and I was wondering how long it takes to get a soil sample result back. Any, any ideas? I think they usually say about five to seven days unless they're really flooded with samples, like can happen sometimes during the spring months. Sure, sure. Okay, let's, uh, let's, move, let's move into our uh, topic of the week, our round table. Dr. Mike Katangi, would you like to bring anything to the table here? <laughs> sure, Rick. Uh, uh, tonight I'm going to talk about ticks. This arachnid, not an insect by the way, it's an arachnid related more to uh, spiders and mites and scorpions. They're now out there feeding on the blood of uh, your pets and also humans. So first slide is a picture of a nice looking uh, dog tick or American dog tick. This thing is the most common right now. They winter as adults so they, they, they have been fed for about six months so they're very hungry. If you go out in the park uh, most likely you will be encountering ticks. So once again this arachnid is out there right now. This is the one that's causing a lot of grief to our folks uh, in the park. And uh, as you know, uh, they can also transmit diseases. And here in South Dakota, tularemia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and even Lyme disease sometimes are very rare. But those uh, microorganisms can be transmitted by uh, dog ticks or, uh, or a wood tick to us. But here in, uh, in, in the parks and also in our acreage, most, most of the time they're mainly a nuisance uh, pest, if you will. So uh, next slide shows. Uh, 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 a group of insecticides, they're called residual insecticides. The most common question I get right now is what can we use to spray our yard, our acreage uh, to control ticks. These are the ones that you can use. These are residual insecticides. What it is really or what they are are insecticides that will last for about three weeks um, on the lawn or any areas where you spray them onto. Again, uh, those things uh, should be available to you pretty commonly. Uh, and uh, you can buy it from anywhere and again, uh, 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 very cheap also. So residual insecticide for spring acreage for ticks right now. So if, if you find a tick on yourself, what's the best way to take that tick off? Oh, I'm glad you brought it up, Rick, because uh, ticks usually takes at least six hours to transmit whatever microorganisms they have. So you need to inspect yourself, your kids, your pets, make sure that ticks are not there for many hours. So, but uh, it's hard to believe that, you know, one would forget to remove a tick for several hours. But remove it, uh, of course, gently, you know, uh, using a forceps because they sometimes are very hard to remove. So remove it gently, gently with a, a pair of forceps and then, and then apply an antiseptic on the wound where the, where the tick attached to your skin. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, Jerry, do you have anything to bring to our round table today? Yeah, I brought along a flower. Uh, a lot of them are popping up uh, this time of the year. Uh, spring has sprung, you might say, and uh, brought along a tulip, and I just want to explain a few things. Uh, this is the colorful portion of it, the blossom, and uh, that's nice, but down here, these leathery leaves, uh, that's a very important part, and that's necessary. So we have nice, and we have necessary. Now allow me to explain. Um, the blossom is nice to enjoy, but some people get in a hurry with the tulips. As soon as the blossoms fade a little bit, they're ready to cut that off and allow some other flowers in the garden uh, to take over that space. And uh, those leaves that you cut off are necessary. Uh, that's what feeds that plant. 
That's what feeds, manufactures food and feeds that bulb for next year's bloom. And so don't get in a hurry to take those uh, leaves off. Let them die and wither down naturally so that they have that time to feed the bulb for next year. Now tulips aren't the only flower that, uh, that uh, is necessary to have that foliage to feed it for next year. Uh, daffodils would fall in the same family. Most all of the spring flowering bulbs such as hyacinth and uh, crocus and the others. Also keep in mind some of the vegetables. Uh, asparagus is another one that after you've taken those spears in the spring you need to allow those ferns to grow throughout the summer months because that's what feeds the crown down there again for next year's spears. Uh, another one commonly found in the landscape would be uh, peonies. Uh, some people, after they bloom, think, well, it's time, I can cut them down. Uh, those leaves are needed to feed that crown for next year's uh, blossom. So let the plant uh, naturally feed itself, get ready for the next year. Very good. Very good. Our other Mike, do you have anything to bring to our table? Well, here? yeah, the weeds are growing out there, and so we're, we're going to be busy with that right off the bat this year. Jerry said spring has sprung, but it's almost like this year's summer has sprung. It's just <laughs> boom. The warm weather has got the weeds ready to go, and now this rain has got them, got us set up for an explosion. So what are we looking for now for controlling weeds? Uh, one of them is crabgrass. We don't see the crabgrass up yet, but that's the perfect time to control it. We want to use those weed and feed crabgrass preventers uh, and we want to apply those before the crabgrass emerges. So if you remember you had annual grasses like crabgrass last year, you're going to want to put a crabgrass preventer on within the next couple weeks. Uh, next slide, we've got a picture of, of other annual grasses you might see out there. This is kind of a mix of foxtails and crabgrass, especially near areas where you watered. They, you know, they'll, they'll be most common there. So those are areas we're going to want to put a weed and feed here now this spring. Now in the next slide, uh, we can see that uh, in the, we'll, we'll see those seedlings that uh, we might be uh, showing up here in the next couple weeks. Once you see those seedlings coming up, it's going to be too late to control them with the crabgrass preventers. So get those on within the next couple weeks to, to beat that crabgrass emergence. Otherwise, timing, uh, if you can't remember, end of April, um, first week of May, a lot of times they say put them on when the lilacs bloom. That's usually the time to put the crabgrass preventers on, but that's oftentimes a little late. So I would generally say last week of April, first week of May is when we want to do that. A lot of very effective products out there. Pendimethalin is very common, but I kind of look to, uh, I like to look for dithiopyr. It seems like that lasts a little bit longer in the soil, but they're all very good. The key is timing. We got to get them on before the crabgrass emerges, which is so we want to get those on within the next couple of weeks. Any any um, non-chemical uh, advice you have for anybody at this? Well, point? with crabgrass, it's a tricky one. Uh, there is corn gluten meal. There are some organic options people are looking at, and corn gluten meal has had some some effect. Uh, it's not going to be quite as good as the herbicides, but. You know, uh, do it a couple of years and you might be able to knock the populations I back. That, I think that takes several applications before it really starts to get going, is that that's correct? That's right, that's right. And it does give you some fertilizer and so there's some other alternative benefits there. But uh, yeah, it's a fairly high rate. I think it's about 20 pounds per thousand square feet, something like that. So it's a fairly high rate, mm -hmm. but uh, but it's a non-chemical non option. Uh, otherwise, just hand pulling. If you have a small patch, maybe that's good enough. You bet. John, you got anything for our table today? Well, I'll just kind of repeat what some of the others have already mentioned tonight. Um, season is running well ahead of schedule, and uh, Jerry brought a sample along with him that he passed off to me. These are some of our, our tent caterpillars, um, webworms, some people call them. And uh, these are already hatched out, and as you can see here, they form their little web, and the larvae are crawling around, the little caterpillars are crawling around inside of there. You know, Mike was mentioning for uh, weed control here, we're a little ahead of schedule, and, and uh, same is true for a lot of those things. And this would be another one of those that typically we wouldn't expect to see this until later on in the season. We'd see these caterpillars usually a couple weeks later, but all of these things are running ahead this year. So if you have some of those routine chores that you do around a garden or around a yard, you want to make sure that you remember that some of those events are occurring a little sooner, at least at this point in the season and try to uh, schedule some of those things accordingly so you get products on at the right time. Now I think most uh, homeowners and, and the general public don't find these things when they're at this size. Is that correct? Is now the time they should be looking for this stuff? Absolutely. This would be, in the case of the tent caterpillars, uh, this would be the time to be out looking for them. 
Ideally, you'd want to find those egg masses. That's when control is simplest, and that would be late winter. You'll see those kind of glassy-looking rings around the tips of twigs. Um, even at this point, control is much easier than if you let them get more advanced when they're more obvious. I think most people, when they see them, they're you know, huge, and then they're wondering what to do, and by then it's too late. Uh, anything else you guys want to add to the, to the discussion here? No, I think we're ready to answer some questions. We're right? ready to answer some questions. All right. Uh, I think we're going to go to a, a short video here first. This, oh, <laughs> the city of Rapid City has about 2,000 acres of parks that includes a variety of gardens. Last week, Garden Line visited with Tim Forrester. He's a greenhouse specialist with the Rapid City Parks Department. And we talked about three different gardens they have there, the Memorial Rose Garden, the Xerscape Garden in the Roosevelt Park, and the Memory Lane Arboretum. Tim, could you tell us uh, about the rose gardens here? Uh, how many roses, What some cultivar, stuff like that? Yeah, Rick, this is the AARS Memorial Rose Gardens. We have about 1,200 roses uh, planted in this park. Uh, probably 110 different varieties. Uh, AARS stands for the All-American Rose Selection, and it is an organization that promotes roses, the excellence in roses. And basically, we get the roses one year before the public can buy them. So it's kind of like a trial bed here. And we plant them. They're sent to us free of charge as long as we keep this up to a certain standard. And the roses can be viewed by the public, and if they like them, they can come buy them from industry the next year. How long has this garden been an AARS display garden? This has been established in 1985. It's the only AARS garden in South Dakota. When can viewers expect the best show here at the Memorial Rose Garden? The best time of the year to view the gardens is the last week in June and the first week in July, depending on the weather. Right around July 4th is the first big bloom. And then around the second, about the middle of August is also another big good time to view the gardens. The Xerscape uh, display garden up at was it Roosevelt uh, yes. Garden. And how often is, do you water that? It depends. There's four different zones in the xeriscaping. And each one has a little different water requirement. And each zone has a, a meter. So we can actually meter how much water is going to each one. So uh, there's a fairly high water area, and there's actually one area that doesn't get any water at all. So it, it's kind of a, a test plot to see what can grow well with or little, little water in this area. And what, what kind of plants are growing in that, in that garden? It's everything from yucca to uh, buffalo grass, uh, spruce trees, you name it. Uh, there's a little bit of everything in the xeriscaping beds. How well do those plants do in the home landscape? If, uh, Very people, well. Do they? Most of those plants will, will uh, exist in Zone 4 quite well, which is Rapid City Zone. So then a homeowner could plant those types of plants and actually reduce their water use? Yes. Significantly, exactly. anyway. Oh, yeah. There's some sedum in there that require very little water and are very decorative. Uh, there's some very interesting plants in that uh, xeriscaping bed that people could use in their gardens. Well, there's a lot of rock in that uh, lowest water use garden yes. there. And is, a, is there a particular reason for that? Well, with rock, it's very low maintenance. And uh, that is actually the, the area that we gets no water at all. And those plants that are in that rock area get, only get the rainfall and they've existed quite well for three years. The Arboretum, uh, what, what is the Arboretum called? Uh, Memory Lane, it's right behind the old regional hospital at the rehab hospital now. How many species of trees are located in that Arboretum? That's a good question, I think about 35 to 50. It's actually a cooperative effort between the Rapid City Garden Club and the City of Rapid City Parks. And uh, with a donation, you can get a tree planted for a group or an individual commemorate someone's life uh, and you get a plaque by it and uh, the city and the Rapid City and the Garden Club actually maintains those, those trees. Well we're uh, ready to answer some questions and the very first question we had even before we started tonight was about native grasses. 
what can uh, we use to spray for weeds in our buffalo grass and our native grasses? Yeah, this follows very well with the segment we just saw. I mean, buffalo grass is a drought-tolerant grass, native in South Dakota, so a great type of species to have that will just naturally kind of compete with a lot of the weeds we have here. So a good option um, for those dry areas, uh, but a little tricky with the weed management. Now you've got, it's a warm season grass, so you've got some flexibility uh, early in the spring while the buffalo grass is still dormant. And if it's entirely brown, you can kind of sneak in with some, you know, Roundup, which is a non-selective herbicide, uh, early in the spring or even late in the fall when it goes dormant there. But you have to be very sure that the grass is entirely brown. If there's any green showing, uh, you could risk some injury. Uh, so that's one option. Otherwise, you got to be careful with your weed control uh, herbicides. Uh, uh, a lot of the weed be gones and things like that that have dicamba will be hard on your buffalo grass. So we want to avoid some of those broadleaf herbicides uh, once summer comes, uh, starts, starts getting into full swing, especially when temperatures start getting a little warm. 2,4-D might be okay as long as temperatures are cool, maybe 80 or less, something somewhere in there, but dicamba can be particularly hard on the buffalo grass. So, so we have some limited herbicide options, but uh, maybe try to get them really early in the spring or maybe even late in the fall, which is a good time to control perennials anyway. Um, with, you know, uh, you know you, uh, weed be gone when it's dormant or a glyphosate type of thing when it's completely dormant though. Okay. Well, you know that dicamba, but that can be tough over trees and shrub roots too. That's right. Here. People have to be careful and calibration is key to uh, making mm -hmm. sure we avoid a lot of those mistakes. Very good. Here I got a question for you, Jerry. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here's one on rhubarb. What is the best time or when is the best time to divide rhubarb? Very good question, uh, timely as well, because uh, spring, early spring is the best time to divide and... Uh, oh my God. <laughs> Jerry, I'm late. Is uh, the very best time to divide rhubarb and, uh, and uh, plant it someplace else, thin out that, that original uh, hill. What, what you find is that when rhubarb gets overgrown and too mature, why well, then, that is the time that it starts to uh, decline in yield. Uh, it uh, shoots at flower stock. It's competing with itself for available moisture and nutrients. So dividing in the early spring, just as those new buds start to pop out, would be an ideal time, or while there's young leaves on there, would be the perfect time to divide and uh, replant your rhubarb. What, what about if people miss that window of opportunity and they go out, out their back door one day and they see their rhubarb is already two feet tall, <laughs> like, like you see today probably? Uh, well, <laughs> it might be in the southern part of the state or out in the hills in the banana zone, uh, but uh, in, in uh, Aberdeen it's not quite to that stage yet. But I'll just say that if you divide it at a later stage, uh, chances of its survival are going to be maybe slim to none. It just is not the time to be doing it. There's a follow-up question to that about asparagus too. Uh, Somebody is wondering if they can divide aspar asparagus now or if they should wait until fall. Again, early spring is the time to divide asparagus. Uh, you want to make sure that you get down to that crown. Uh, this might be some shallow planted type, uh, but the best way to plant Asparagus is in a trench. Uh, put it in the bottom of that trench and st as it starts to grow and uh, each time it comes above that soil that you put in there, put, add some more soil to it so that, that crown is well down below the, the ground and uh, you'll have a much healthier asparagus plant as a result. Very good. How about, how about a bug question, uh, Mike? Are you ready? <laughs> sure. any, any update on emerald ash borer? Is it in South Dakota yet? Uh, uh, as of today, we have not found the emerald ash borer in South Dakota. Again, have not. We have not found emerald ash borer in South Dakota, but it's already in Minnesota. Uh, it's in the St. Paul area last year, so it's getting closer. So, uh, but once again, it's not found here yet in South Dakota. Now, uh, it, there's some uh, questions still there, Rick, right? They're, they're asking something about? Uh, uh, they're, they're wondering if it's in South Dakota and uh, they're looking for, oh, wait, there is something there. Look at that. <laughs> hey. <laughs> uh, what can we do to prevent it? <laughs> sure. Right now, really, we want you to uh, help us. Uh, uh, be on the lookout for this insect. Most importantly, do not move or buy any wood. 
you know, you'll be camping this year. Do not buy or um, uh, import any wood. Just look, uh, use a locally uh, obtained, uh, you know, wood for your camp campfire. Uh, so that's the most important right now, and educate yourself on what uh, this insect looks like and then what it can do. But if you really are worried, uh, well, once again, we're not recommending treatments any yet, but if you cannot sleep at night, there's a soil drench that you can, uh, you know, use. Uh, uh, it contains a bit of clothed. You measure the diameter or circumference with the tree, and you just use it as a soil drench. It's a systemic product, but once again, in general, we do not recommend that you treat yet because it's not found in South Dakota yet. I'd like to follow up on, a, on, on the answer you just gave there a little bit for the folks out uh, in my neck of the woods out in the hills. We're, we're seeing a lot of pine beetles uh -huh. and is that chemical useful on the mountain pine beetle or is there better, better solutions or what should we be doing about mountain pine beetle right now? A uh, mountain pine beetle like the emerald ash borer is a beetle so uh, I mean the clover would also work but uh, for mountain pine beetle in your area the recommendation Rick is to treat uh, the bark of the tree before the flight of the bark beetle, before they emerge from the dead trees. And usually, you want those residual insecticides, you know, even your hose and sprays, you want something in the bark of the tree. That way, when the, when the main flight or the bark beetle uh, in June occurs, then uh, they cannot lay eggs on your tree. So right now, that's the uh, most common recommendation that uh, we, we recommend for folks who want to protect their healthy tree from uh, the flight uh, in June of the mountain uh, pine beetle. That, that seems like a whole lot easier of a solution than uh, treating, you know, 150 That's right. uh, <laughs> pine trees. Well, that, with, uh, that, with the main the challenge, of course, is some of your trees are pretty tall. You know, how in the world can you? Apply? Sometimes you yep. may want to, you may want to hire your, uh, you know, uh, uh, tree doctors, if you will. So. <laughs> All right. How about a question for John here? Uh, Austrian pines. Do pine needles make a good mulch for other trees, uh, like under a spruce tree? or a good mulch at all? Well, in other states we see them sold quite heavily as mulches actually and um, they do a nice job of suppressing other vegetation so if, if that's what you're looking at is trying to keep that weedy growth or other growth down underneath there I think pine needles would be a decent choice. One consideration that you might want to make on that is that they do tend to limit growth sometimes even after you remove them. If you decide you want to plant in those areas uh, you may not get the growth in plants there that you would like to see later on. So do you recommend leaving those pine needles underneath the pine tree if, if that's what, you're what you have growing in your yard? Uh, again, if you're looking to, to keep other things down underneath there, uh, absolutely. You know, it does a nice job of that. All right, how about, how about this one, John? Uh, young, young apple trees had a blight where the leaves curled. They pruned the apple, the, apparently the blighted portion of the tree out. They used a diluted uh, chlorine solution on the tools after each cut. Could they spray the soil with that chlorine solution to help prevent the blight? Do you think that would uh, help out at all? Well, I'm not sure exactly which blight they're looking at here. From the description, the first one that would jump to my mind would be fire blight, which would be a bacterial disease of the trees. Spraying the soil with that chlorine solution won't do much at all to control it. Once it gets into the tree, it's very difficult, if at all possible, to remove it from that tree. The recommendation for cleaning the tools with that chlorine solution is to try to prevent it from spreading to other trees. If you end up pruning other trees with the same tools, you could be carrying them. And so if you clean them properly, you can avoid some contamination and, and further infection of other trees. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure spraying the soil with chlorine would be a great idea. I think that would no, I, actually I be something we wouldn't want to do. You control the weeds. Well, yeah, that's true, and maybe, <laughs> and the, and maybe the tree, too. Uh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> speaking of weeds, uh, uh, we have a call, caller that's wondering what, are the recommend, what the recommended control is for burr buttercup. Yeah. And what is burr buttercup, too? Well, so speaking sure. of, of zero scapes and dry land plants, burr buttercup is one that's creeping into South Dakota and becoming more problem because it's very well adapted here. Uh, and, and perhaps I think next week we'll talk about it. We'll show some pictures of it and that sort of thing next week so everybody is aware of it. But it is a nasty little lawn weed, probably one of the nastiest lawn weeds you could imagine. It has a, it's a very tiny plant, so it has a very short life cycle. Uh, and that's what makes it so tricky to, to control. Uh, and, and the problem with it is, is that it produces a little burr, 
So as soon as it's done growing, it leaves behind this nasty little burr that lingers for the rest of the summer and becomes uh, quite a nuisance. So to control it, you really got to get out there as soon as the snow is melting and maybe you could go over it with like a garden rake um, or you know you could use a herbicide, a broadleaf herbicide, uh, you know the weed be gone, Trimex, things like that, uh, while it's still in the vegetative phase before it produces that, that little burr. But if you only have a one or two week window to do this, so timing is key. Uh, aside from that, it usually likes uh, droughty, compacted soils, that sort of thing. So while you're in the process of controlling this bur burr buttercup, you might want to focus on aerating that soil, getting the grass reinvigorated uh, to compete with it because it is a very tiny plant. So some different options there. It's very difficult to control because you have to get out there so early in the spring and we're probably already too late. But, uh, but next year, uh, go ahead and go after it. Otherwise, this year, like you say, you could rake it and that sort of thing to try to get the burrs out. But no good options there. All righty. Uh, caterpillars. What should we spray uh, apple trees with to kill caterpillars? Uh, they might be talking about what John uh, showed <laughs> earlier. Uh, what that caterpillars really, especially on apple, then I would prefer that you use an organic product. And there are two very good ones, uh, two active ingredients. One is a BT spray, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki. Usually it comes under the name thuricide or dipel. Uh, so once again, that's, uh, that product is an organic product. Uh, so especially when you're spraying an apple tree, you might be, you know, drenched uh, or sprayed by, by the spray that you're using. So use a BT spray. Uh, uh, another spray, an organic spray, is something that contains spinosad. So uh, it's a new, relatively new product, spinosad. And the, the brand name for that, Rick, is very interesting. It's Captain Jack Dead Bug Brew. That's a nice name. So two that products is a nice name. Yeah, huh? Captain Jack Dead Bug Brew, Spinosad. So. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, how, about, how about on spirea? Can you trim back spirea and burning bush to about six inches or so? Or is it too late now? Uh, John or, or Jerry, either one of you, I guess. Well, uh, you want me to take a stab at it first here, Jerry? <laughs> Go ahead. We'll team well, this one, all right? Okay. okay. We got two different kinds of shrubs going here. Yeah. Um, and I think you want to handle these two differently. Although, in my opinion, this is probably not the best time to be pruning either one. I would try to wait until they're dormant to be pruning them. Take the spirea first. When you look at the spirea shrub, you typically see a number of stems or tiny little trunks coming out of the ground. And the typical recommendation there is that you prune roughly a third of them off every year. You take the oldest third off and leave the other two thirds of them and it'll regenerate. Every three years you end up with a completely new shrub. Kind of a nice way to do it. But again, that's one that I'd want to handle in the fall rather than uh, in the spring. Or if I did it in the spring, it, you want to do that before the leaves start coming out in the spring. The other one, the burning bush, I'm assuming that they're talking about a euonymus uh, shrub gets the bright red leaves in the fall. And typically those have only a single trunk. I don't know how well they would do coming back if you cut it down to six inches. I, I think you might really hurt that shrub or uh, at least make it look pretty funny on that one. I don't know what you think on that one, Jerry. Well, I'm gonna start with the spirea first. Uh, there's, there's two definitions of pruning. Uh, you talked about rejuvenation where you take out a third each year. Uh, to keep it fresh and, and new sprouts coming. Uh, there's another method uh, that if you need to renew the entire bush, I mean, it has gotten so overgrown that it has woody trunks and, and then this plume of nice green on the top. You need to renew it. Uh, the time to do that is late March, early April, and you can quite literally take it down to two inches from the ground. And uh, then it will renew itself from the base, from the root, and uh, within it, Growing, you aren't going to get blossoms that year. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have to forego the blossoms, but within a growing season, that bush is going to be back up to its uh, original size and shape, but it's going to be new growth on it, and it's going to be looking a lot better. Uh, the other type of pruning would be seasonal pruning. If you want to just shape it a little bit, uh, the time to do that is after it has finished blooming. And so the light pruning would, would come after the bloom has finished. I'm going to pass on the euonymus. I think we need to get back to that, uh, that party there and find out, first of all, whether you can get that drastic with the euonymus or not. Well, the rabbits like it, right? 
Oh, it's rabbit candy. Yeah, in the winter. <laughs> so maybe the rabbit sprung it already. So <laughs> I'd, I'd, too late <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add a little something to the spirea conversation, if I could. Spirea, really, there's two types of spireas. And one, we want to prune right when the flowers are done flowering, or you do cut off all those flowers. And the other one, we can prune any time, basically, during the season because it flowers on current growth. You know, so you can, you can, it depends on what type. So you need to know what kind of spirea you have. All right, earlier tonight we learned how to collect a soil sample from the garden in order to learn the fertility of the soil. The results from that soil sample are back and contain all kinds of mystic letters and numbers. We're going back to Jim Gerwin's garden now to learn how to interpret those results and how to apply the proper amount of fertilizer. When we get our soil test report back from the soil testing lab for our garden, it will report how many pounds of nutrients should be applied per thousand square feet. So let's say we get a recommendation for one pound of nitrogen per thousand, thousand square feet. That's not exactly how much fertilizer material will apply because the fertilizer material comes as a percent of the total that's in the bag. Uh, um, for example, if the fertilizer material in the bag was 25% nitrogen, that first number on the bag, that was a 25 and then something something for phosphorus and potassium. It's only one-fourth nitrogen. So if they recommend one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, we'd have to put on four pounds of that fertilizer material. And, and, and that's how we'd make that calculation. And then, of course, we have to look at how big our garden is. And if we look at this garden we have us behind here, it's about 12 feet by about 20 feet. And so if we do the math there, 12 times 20, comes out to approximately 250 square feet. Well, 250 square feet is one-fourth of a thousand. And we just did our calculation to come up with four pounds of fertilizer material for a thousand square feet. Therefore, on this garden, to put on one pound of N per thousand square feet, we would really only need to put on about one pound of the fertilizer material. Once we have it, we can actually spread this small amount of material by hand. It's very difficult to use fertilizer spreaders and get the right rate on. And so we can actually put a glove on our hand. Fertilizer is not very toxic material. You can do it by hand, but just use a regular plastic glove like you might use for painting or something like that. It might want to take a little practice, but we just put it in our hand and just kind of shake our hand back and forth and let it dribble out over the top like this. And a little bit of practice, uh, really you can spread it about as evenly or, or better than with any fertilizer spreader that you have, especially for odd areas like in, in your garden. And you'd want to do this and spread it real thinly to begin with so that you can actually go over your garden area several times you can see that it looks like a, a perfect fertilizer spreader has gone across your, your garden. And then after that, you can do your tillage to, to uh, incorporate it into the garden. One of the problems we have with garden fertilizer, though, is that when you go to your local retailer, your hardware store, your Walmart, Kmart, or whatever, is that most garden fertilizers will contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. When we look at results from the soil testing lab, Often, if we put fertilizer on the garden in the past, we will only need nitrogen. And so my encouragement would be to, to actually do the calculation like we talked about for just nitrogen, and you'll actually be putting on equal amounts of phosphorus and potassium if it would be like a 10-10-10 or a 12-12-12 fertilizer. And actually, that's why the phosphorus and potassium levels are building up in soils. It doesn't hurt the, the, the soil to have more phosphorus or potassium in it but it, it also builds up and so uh, we can't really do that same calculation for each nutrient because you're always going to put the other one on on with it so my encouragement is go just for the nitrogen and let the, the rest fall where it where it may be We are back with some more questions. Uh, this comes from a friend of mine in Spearfish. Um, Mike, what, what do house plants, or what to do with house plants with black flies or white flies? And I assume she's asking about fungus gnats. You know, Rick, uh, 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 those two insects might be different uh, because uh, uh, black flies, you, you're right, might be fungus gnats, and then, but they're, they're re real white flies, you know, they're very common indoors, like in hibiscus. 
So I'll, I'll take a stab on the a black fly or the fungus gnat, and that one uh, breeds in the potting soil. So uh, uh, usually when you overwater it and you see this uh, uh, fungus gnats emerging, uh, they're very harmless, they're duck composers mainly, again, they breed in the soil. Now, there's a very simple uh, uh, thing that you can do. Uh, they're in the same group as mosquitoes. So you know those mosquito dunks that you buy or the larvicide, it, it's a Bt product, Bt israelensis. It's a different Bt, it's for mosquitoes. So what you do is to break it apart, the mosquito dunk, you know, kind of a donut shape or sometimes in granules. And then you let it stand in a pail of water and you use that water for watering. That will kill the larva of these fungus gnats. But I would still, again, uh, try to identify the insect properly. That way uh, we control it properly. With the white flies, then you can use canola oil or pyrethrin used for indoors. But once again, you might be dealing with two insects for uh, fungus gnats, uh, uh, water using a BT kind of a solution, uh, or you let the water steep with a BT, the mosquito dunk, use it for watering, will kill the larva. And for white flies, you use a, a pyrethrin spray, especially with canola oil. I've heard I've heard that you can use potato slices on those fungus gnats. Oh, so there you go. Yeah, you recommend yeah. that. Well, I suppose there's no harm in trying. Let's do some <laughs> research. Uh, maybe we could publish the results. Maybe <laughs> the old potato as a, as a fungus gnat <laughs> control. Uh, always the researcher, <laughs> huh? <laughs> well, we're still getting uh, more uh, weed type questions. Uh, uh, Woman in Mitchell is asking uh, about red cedar trees planted in a shelter belt, and there's some Chinese elm coming up in between them, and uh, wondering what she can use to kill the elms and not the cedars. Oh, to kill the elms to and kill not the, the elms cedars. And not the cedars. Well, there's not a lot you can just, you know, as far as spray goes, and just spray over the whole thing and, and kill one and not the other necessarily. Uh, with those Chinese elms, and Chinese elms are pretty tough. Uh, you're Unfortunately, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and get in there with the saw and, and cut those out. Uh, and then, to help prevent the suckers from coming back, you're going to want to treat those stumps. Uh, there's a couple different options. You could use uh, just like a Roundup or a glyphosate type solution. Maybe about a 50% solution of, of glyphosate and just coat those freshly cut stems. And you want to do that right after you cut them. Or there's uh, triclopyr type herbicides like um, you know, you could go to your hardware store and get uh, like a brush type herbicide, it'll, it'll have triclopyr in it, brush be gone, things like that. We'll have triclopyr. Same type of thing, uh, put a concentrated solution right on those freshly cut stems uh, to avoid some of that regrowth. So it's going to be a, a lot of muscle work getting in there. You're going to have to physically remove them and then coat those stems with something to help prevent regrowth. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. How about I know I sent you an email not too long about this asparagus, a herbicide you can use in asparagus. Well, yeah, there's not a lot of selective type um, options there. Um, uh, you know, you, early in the spring before the spears come up, yeah, you can use like a, a preen type herbicide, uh, trifluralin, uh, to help give you some residual control to control grasses and some broadleaves before they emerge. Um, otherwise, you know, of course, you know, before the spears come up, you could, you know, use Roundup as, as long as you're sure that there's no spears emerging. Uh, otherwise, you know, there's, that, that's really probably about it, really, that we can do. So not a lot of herbicide options in, in asparagus. Best thing you can do, get out there early now before we get all those weeds coming in and, and maybe give it some mulch, that sort of thing, to prevent uh, weed problems later on. Okay. Uh, John, how about uh, somebody's got a honey crisp apple tree? It's leafed out. The leader is now. Now well, I can't read this, but uh, they're wondering about moving that. Should they move it now, or should they leave it where it's at? Uh, leafed out? Is that? It has leafed out. Uh, the. Uh, it's been about two to three weeks since it leafed out, or do they don't expect it to change for two to three weeks. I'm not exactly sure, but I'm assuming okay. they're, they've got a tree they want to move. Uh, do you think they should move that tree at this time? Right. Well, to me, a lot of that's going to depend on the size of the tree, and I think if we knew a little bit more about the size of that tree, that would play a bigger role on that. If it's a relatively small tree, uh, especially if it was planted maybe this spring or, or last fall even, uh, you know, the roots will probably still be fairly well contained. It may be fairly easy to simply lift that tree and, and transplant it to where you want. If the tree has been in for a few years, um, having moved a few trees that way, I can tell you it's a lot of work and uh, unless you've got a tree spade handy, um, you may do more damage than, than good at trying to move that tree at this point. 
What what would you suggest if they were to move this tree? Uh, how wide should they make that root ball? It depends, again, very much on the size of that tree, but typically what you can figure is that the roots will extend out roughly as far as that tree will fall if it were to tip over. Um, it's going to cover a pretty broad area on that, and, and so trying to dig those roots out by hand, you know, if you do it, you're going to be pruning a lot of those off. Even with a tree spade, you'll end up pruning a fair number of those roots off. So wider, wider would be better then. The wider the better. <laughs> All right. Um, some wild raspberries in a camping area. Um, let's see, lar large patch of wild raspberries. Last year they were invaded by small purple thistles. I think this is going to be a question for you, Mike. Okay. They want to get rid of the thist thistles and not hurt the raspberries or the wildlife for that matter. Oh boy, yeah, there's not going to be um, a lot of selective options there. I'm trying to, there's really, um, yeah, there's, for herbicides, you know, there's not going to be any quick and easy solution. Um, unfortunately, you're probably going to have to go in there and do some hand plucking. And of course, I know Canada thistles are perennial, and you're going to get more shoots coming back from the roots. Uh, but really, that's that's about all you could really do. Um, people in these situations sometimes get tempted to sneak in there and, and maybe put some rubber gloves on and maybe wipe a little Roundup on the leaves. But uh, in these types of tight situations, it's really risky because if you get any Roundup on those on, on the berries or that sort of thing around the bush that you're trying to keep. Uh, you could do some serious damage there. So fortunately, we got to go old school on this one and just manual labor and mulch is about all I can recommend on that. Sometimes, you know, that's the <laughs> best way to go. Huh? Well, maybe not Sorry the best, but the only way. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Jerry, uh, someone's wondering about tomato and cuke seedlings that were transplanted outdoors five weeks ago. They're turning yellow, and what, what would be the cause of that, do you think? I think for that question we need to start at the point that uh, there are cool season vegetables and there are warm season vegetables. Uh, cool season would include, uh, as far as transplants, the, the cabbage, the coals, uh, the broccoli, the cauliflower, that sort of thing. They're plants, uh, transplants that can withstand cool weather. In fact, they can even go through a light frost and, and survive very well. Then on the other hand, we have those warm season vegetables such as uh, the vine crops, including cucumbers, uh, then tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. And, and I think this party, uh, I noticed that was from Sioux Falls. And even though spring comes there sooner than most areas of the state, if they put those in out in the garden five weeks ago, uh, they're really tempting Mother Nature there. Uh, and, and I think it's just been too cool, uh, too damp, too wet, and uh, those plants are not happy. They, they need warm soil. They want to take off and probably should not have gone in the garden until mid-May, perhaps. And so unless they've been protecting those plants, uh, those plants have gotten chilled. And uh, they're, I'll be surprised if they make it in all reality. Well, I think even, even if they're protecting those, the soils are still pretty cold, and that, and that makes a big difference, too. Big difference, yep. Uh, two questions on night crawlers and bumpy yards. Uh, Mike, what do you think of that? <laughs> well, this is one of those pretty controversial questions and answers, so I would prefer that you email me after the show <laughs> because there's a lot of folks who want to conserve night crawlers because, as you know, uh, they do something to the soil and indicate you're a very fertile soil. Uh, right now, uh, uh, the only way really to do it uh, would be to uh, power rake, that way you uh, even out the, the bumpy ground, but really there is something that you can do, but I wouldn't want to, to tell you on TV, so email me after the show. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't believe there's any uh, <laughs> chemicals labeled for uh, night crawlers anyway, I, uh, by what I've heard, is and that, that correct? That can be recommended on live TV, right? So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, would you like to give her your email address so they can Well, do I think to bring through a garden line, so. <laughs> no, he's going he's gonna to defer on that one, too, I think. They, they can find it. If not, they can get a hold of any of us, and we'll probably give it to them. So. <laughs> uh, you mentioned dicamba earlier, Mike. Uh, can, can you spray Trimec now? Is that, is that dicamba, or what, what is Trimec? 
Yeah, there's a you know most of those broadleaf herbicides that are available now contain dicamba and 2,4-D, and then usually some other herbicide, MCPA or triclopyr, something like. That. So there's a mix. Most of them are a mix. That includes dicamba and. Sure, we can spray now, and in fact, now is not a bad time. You know, where people got those dandelions and the creeping Charlie, things like that that are starting to flower now. Uh, they want to get out there and, and kind of get rid of them. If we're spraying now, though, for perennials, really all we're doing is defoliating them. Uh, fall applications will do a lot more to control the roots, which is key for those perennials. But uh, at least now you can prevent seed production, which can help a little bit. Plus, now the leaves aren't really out yet on the trees. Maybe the garden's not quite growing yet. So the risk of that off-site injury is, is pretty small right now, making this another kind of good time to go out there and, and do some of that, that type of spraying with some of these herbicides that have a risk of volatilizing and moving and causing off-site damage. So want to be careful, as always, uh, but sure, you go ahead now. Uh, but keep in mind, you're probably going to have to go back in this fall uh, to control those perennials. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, we got a couple of questions here. Uh, one about daffodils. I'm just going to throw out there and see if anybody wants to go for this. Uh, they've been in the ground for three years. They grow well. They're in 80% of the day. They're in sunlight, but they never bloom. Um, normal ground, not wet. Tulips grow well there. Any, anybody got any thoughts on why these daffodils might not be blooming? I've run across a situation like that up in Aberdeen. Uh, the gentleman invited me over and, and when I took a look at the daffodil patch what had happened is the bulbs had of course reproduced themselves to the point where that patch of daffodils was so crowded and competing with itself that none of them really had the opportunity to gather enough energy food to actually make a blossom. I recommended that he dig them and uh, spread those out and replant those bulbs and give them space to grow and the next year he had blooms. Now, Jerry, in your opening remarks, uh, you mentioned not to cut off the bloom. Uh, you think it's related to that, too, where they removed the, I mean, the, the leaves, you know? It sure could have been, but uh, I believe it sounded like in this case they're getting good leaves, they're allowing that to go, but just no blooms, and I think they're competing with themselves. Are daffodils the same as maybe tulips in terms of, uh, is, does it apply they to the They have a more, more of a propensity, the daffodils do, to, to generate additional okay. bulbs within that given area, and so they get overcrowded. I see. Okay. Good, good. Uh, here's another one. Uh, somebody planted two apples and two cherries three years ago, and the rabbits chewed. They didn't girdle the trees. Uh, any precaution that can be taken to heal the wound from the rabbits? John? Well, <laughs> rabbit damage is a bad one. Yeah, rabbit damage can be a, a bad one. As far as trying to heal what's already been done, um, you know, trim that bark up, make sure that it's fairly even there. My main concern at this point would be, even if it's not girdled all the way around, is it enough that it's going to really hurt the tree or possibly kill the tree? You know, if it gets more than halfway, even much more than a third of the way, it can do some fairly serious damage to that tree. And if that's the case, they may need to look at doing something called bridge grafting to try to get some bark across there and, and help that tree along if they're interested in preserving it. The other recommendation that I would make is trying to protect those trees in the fall or in the winter so that the rabbits can't get to them. And you know, one of the easiest and least expensive ways of handling that is to simply wrap the trunks with aluminum foil in the fall up at least as high as you expect the snow to go in the fall so the rabbits can't get above it. <laughs> here's, here's another one. Uh, somebody has a six foot to six and a half foot bur oak with about a quarter, an inch and a quarter um, caliper at the base of the tree and he wants to move it. I know we talked about moving a little bit ago but uh, he wants to know how big of a root ball he needs to make to make to move that bur oak. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll take that one if you don't mind, John. Go for it, Jerry. Um, bur oak are one of those types of trees that develops a very extensive tap root. And uh, you plant a bur oak and it, it seems to, a young bur oak, and it seems to sit still there for a uh, year, two, sometimes as many as three years. And then all of a sudden it takes off just like it got ready to grow. And what it was doing in that first three or so years is developing that taproot. 
And bur oak is one tree that just does not transplant very well because regardless of, of how deep you go, you're still going to sever that taproot. And so bur oak is, is one of those trees that you better decide where you're going to put it <laughs> the first time, and it's a good idea to leave it there. Well, so think, if he wants to move it, get a tree spade. Don't try I, to do that one. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good advice on most trees. we got about uh, one minute left here. I'm going to throw a question out at uh, Mike here. Uh, this is an email question. They've got Creeping Charlie in the yard and sprayed it once with Weed Be Gone this spring. Some of it is brown, but some looks very healthy. She would like to hurt it badly before she plants her <laughs> nearby garden spot. Any any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, if, if we get partial control, I mean, spring really isn't the best time to go after these perennials. Fall is much better, but we're just trying to defoliate them now, so that's okay. Um, but if, if you did get partial control, usually we lay, maybe wait a week or two, come back, uh, let the plant start to regrowing, and then hit it again maybe uh, to give it that death blow. And so... Uh, uh, otherwise, maybe she just missed the, those spots the first time. In that case, she could go in at any time. But uh, otherwise, yeah, maybe wait a few week, maybe wait a, a week or two and, and hit it again. Okay, thank you. That's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line will repeat twice per week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting's Create Channel, also known as SDPB3. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. So you guys will be able to watch yourselves, too. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel of experts, Mike Katangi, Extension Entomologist. Jerry Mills from Brown County is the Extension Horticulture Educator there. Mike McNig, Extension Weed Specialist. And John Kiekeffer, Brookings County Extension Agronomy Educator. Thanks to the Brookings Master Gardeners, our phone volunteers, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications.